Thanks, Sarah. Well, Rangi Kipa's personal history and artistic practice have been closely intertwined with New Zealand's indigenous Maori population rights movement, which in many ways draws on the experience and strategies of the American civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s. Kipa's work is included in significant collections in New Zealand and has been exhibited at the Goff Rosenthal in New York City and at a, the inaugural exhibition of the Denver Museum of Contemporary Art in Colorado. His awards include the 2006 Creative New Zealand Craft Object Art Fellowship and the Molly Morpeth Canada Creative Excellence Award in 2004. He was a graduate of Mararoa Carving School in, I'm sorry, Peru, 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 New Zealand, and received a BS from uh, Waikato University in New Zealand, as well as a Master of Maori Visual Arts from Massey University in Wellington, New Zealand. He resides in Hopi, New Zealand. The title of his presentation today, which I won't do much better in pronouncing, is Tino Rangatiratanga, an insider's reflection on the Maori sovereignty movement. Please join me in welcoming Rangi Kipa. Uh, I'd just like to start off, I suppose, with uh, thanking you for, for coming today. Um, I have to apologise, uh, I've got a throat infection, so you just have to put up with my Barry White um, impersonation. Um, uh, just a brief history, I've had a, well, it's come to be quite a long relationship with uh, a number of the members, um, and specifically through Joseph Ostroff in the BYU Art Department, and um, that's bordering on 10 years now. We've had a, a, a significant relationship with that department of which we've uh, traveled with our faculty, arts faculty, to BYU and had uh, uh, an exhibition as well as a number of uh, undergraduates and graduates have come to New Zealand and spent uh, time in our faculty when we were teaching or lecturing in uh, Whakatane as well as um, they've come and live with us, uh, you know, probably three or four times over the last 10 years. Um, I'll be frank with you, uh, uh, this is a difficult uh, discussion for me. It's a, it's a personal issue, and normally I have, I have difficulty discussing it in, in the public forum. So, uh, you know, I'll, just, I'll be frank with that. Uh, how I'd like to run, run this uh, lecture is, is that I'd like it to be an open discussion. What I'm going to do is uh, I've put up here a number of uh, propositions about uh, our practice. Both my wife and I um, have been practicing artists for the good majority of our lives. I trained at the, at the age of 17 at Marairoa Carving School, which was a customary carving school, uh, and then eventually went on to move across, across uh, the spectrum of arts and, and eventually move into the contemporary fine arts. Uh, so I've been practicing for 28 years now. I'm 45. And my experience of the, I mean, it's not just closely intertwined. My art practice and my role as an advocate for, for Māori art has, is, is inexplicably linked with the um, desire of our community to seek some control over their lives. So um, what I would like is, is as I move through the nature of, uh, of some of these questions and I move through a slideshow with some 140 slides, I'd like you uh, at any opportunity to, to just ask any questions that, that arise. I'd rather that you ask them than not ask them um, because then it gives you an opportunity to drive the nature of the discussion uh, so that it has some relevance to you as well. Uh, both my wife and I have, um, have been involved with tertiary teaching as well as um, running co you know, community programs amongst our own community. Uh, my wife has got four degrees and is now um, finishing her doctorate. She was supposed to be here, uh, but she got, has got behind in some of her work. Uh, excuse me. So, um, you know, our, our relationship and our approach to work has been... Uh, once again, in, inextricably linked. Uh, a number of propositions that I've got here today. Art, 
We've used art as a personal and public tool for cultural, social, political, and economic change. Uh, exploring the struggle and contesting the struggle between competing epistemologies, between the, the native indigenous um, worldview and between that of the dominant, and a lot of our people would argue that the hegemonic um, nature of, of the dominant society, the English as they've colonized us. Uh, I'd like to also propose that, um, that we've used art as a tool for autochthonous cultural recovery and as an advocacy for internal reflection and debate. Um, as we've borrowed, or as we've revived um, traditional cultural ideologies and tried to restore those, just the nature of moving through time and the nature of uh, not living in a, a vacuum anymore has meant that we've had to try and adapt those ideologies, adapt those theories to, to, to not even respond to the needs that that our own community has to, to restore their own integrity and well-being, but also then to try and find a way to combat the, the, the sort of machine, you know, the colonial machine that continues to sort of turn on and have uh, an influence, a commanding influence in our daily lives. I'm also proposing the notion of art as a medium for peaceful protest and as the provocateur to notions of cultural solipsism. And you can see the de definition there of solipsism, the extreme preoccupation with and indulgence in one's own feelings and desires over that of the, the other. And uh, I suppose the last uh, proposition is the, is the concept of aroha or the concept of, this, of, of love as being the missing ingredient really to, towards finding some uh, major, major solutions to some of the issues that our community faces in Aotearoa. What is the tenor or the nature of the debate that the marginalized try to communicate to the dominant or the imperial community? Uh, I, I imagine that most of you have some idea of our uh, colonial history. You know, we've been uh, a society that's occupied the islands of New Zealand for roughly a thousand years before uh, Tasman arrived on our shores. And then after Tasman's, um, some of his uncomfortable, um, I suppose, uh, conflicts that he had with, it, with our people, he left fairly quickly and we didn't have anyone else arrive until Cook arrived roughly 100 years later. And since then, uh, the, the, the colonial influx of people from, from Britain predominantly over the succeeding uh, years has uh, left, left us in a fairly sorry state. Um, my grandparents and parents' generation, my great-grandparents, grandparents and parents' generation, I think had no option but to try and buy in to the notion of uh, assimilation. Uh, you know, that was the predominant ideology of the, of the colonial uh, immigrants. And I think uh, at the arrival of the the civil rights movement, it became really clear to our people, especially our young people, that the assimilationist theories didn't work. It didn't allow you to, uh, to buy in or it didn't allow uh, open access to, to things that were expected as part of that assimilationist process. So uh, as part of, uh, I suppose, the media and various other forms of information that we were getting, the revolution, revolutionizing, I suppose, of theories of, of indigenous peoples that had been colonized, the civil rights movement was a, a significant part of the spearhead that changed our people's thinking from a passive acceptance of, uh, of, of the colonial imposition to a point where we realized that we were really gonna have to fight the fight to, to, to gain some control over our lives again. <clears throat> the last question I've got, is anyone there? Does anyone really care? Does anyone really want to listen? Because for some years now, since uh, the establishment of the Treaty of Waitangi um, and the, the, tri sorry, the Waitangi Tribunal, which is a, a government uh, tribunal established to, to hear claims by the indigenous communities, by the indigenous population against the Crown, 
uh, some 25 years ago, it's been, it's been, I suppose, uh, argued by the indigenous community that it's a toothless tiger, that it's a toothless uh, act, and that even though the tribunal uh, gives recommendations, gives findings that the Crown is supposed to hear and supposed to listen to, uh, very rarely does the Crown ever follow up and, and manifest, I suppose, the uh, findings that the tribunal hears. And so from our people's perspective, even though uh, there's been a legislative body that's been set up that's able to hear uh, claims by our people, very little, we, we feel that very little has actually happened. Although there's been a large volume of, um, of documentation that's, that's come out of, as part of that process. Uh, but invariably, uh, one of the things that I struggle with is that any nature of, of, of the debate that happens around the Crown's uh, transgressions of the treaty ends up becoming a, a, a legalistic debate, ends up becoming a debate that sits down and tries to quantify and qualify, you know, uh, the value of land confiscations, uh, and various other transgressions of, of our property, instead of sitting down and actually discussing what we want to discuss, which is the nature of what happened, why it happened, and how we can adequately resolve it so that we can move ahead in the future. Uh, invariably, the debate always becomes uh, a debate around money and about quantifying it in a fiscal sense. The problem that I have with that is, is that Money doesn't, doesn't heal, the mamai doesn't heal the pain. And whilst there's a process that sets about, uh, I suppose, remunerating uh, and developing and providing an economic base for our communities to, to take some control over their lives, politically, economically, uh, socially, and um, well, in any other way in which you can possibly imagine, the problem is, is that I that I see is, is that it doesn't resolve the disparity or the 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 depth of pain that still exists between our community and the colonial community. Because invariably, the people that were the soldiers or the militia uh, by the crown that came onto our lands and took our lands, burnt our houses, imprisoned our people, suspended habeas corpus, all of that sort of stuff, they were the ones that were paid with the land that was confiscated by the crown. And so invariably those people and the descendants that still own our land are the ones that we have issue with and that we want to resolve the, the pain with. And uh, for the most case, I think that when our people feel like they've been heard, when they feel like they, their pain's been felt, a lot of the pain, obviously, um, you know, a lot of the transgression is forgiven. Uh, for me, $40 million for the settlement of a tribal claim, if our people were well again and had, uh, if we had our own integrity as a community again, we could raise $40 million by ourselves quite easily. So uh, for me, that's actually not the solution uh, to the way ahead for our people in, in, in the country, even though we need the Crown to restore some of our economic base. Oh, I should probably make it clear too that it's always been a principal part of uh, our stand against the Crown that any time we take a claim against the Crown, it's not against any person that holds any Māori property in their private hands. It's always against the Crown, and we're, all, we're only ever after what the Crown can provide back that's still in ownership of, by the Crown. So, you know, I should make that really clear that uh, our people have been really, really clear to make sure that we're not interested in uh, resolving an injustice by creating another injustice by taking land or property off of uh, private owners, of individuals. Questions? Um, I've got a series of images here. They're of people in, uh, uh, in various states of undress. I, I don't think that they are um, offensive, but I apologize if, if, they, if they do create any offense. Uh, I'd like to talk about art now as a tool for social recovery, for cultural change and for social recovery. One of the things that I realized when I was going through my Bachelor of Social Sciences is as I was studying, I realized that when 
we were taken through the process of how colonial engagement happened, how that whole process worked through its normal you know, cogs of, of machinery and how it went through the process of systematically dispossessing people. One of the things that I realised was is that if we could find ways to reverse some of those processes that happened, we could actually then start to restore, systematically restore parts of the cogs of the wheel where we've, you know, where we've got dysfunction. So as the colonial machine moved through its processes, um, you know, outlawing particular practices, outlawing functional roles that our people played within our community, uh, out, or, well, confiscating land, systematically the Crown went through taking physical resources and then systematically after that they used various acts to break down our social cohesion all of the things that kept our community, kept the fabric alive and together and, and well. Uh, so I became aware of the opportunity that we could look at some of those practices and there are a lot of them that uh, exist within the realm of the arts, whether they're the performing arts, the visual arts, the, the oral arts. They're, they're an essential part of the transmission of, of knowledge within our communities. So if we could restore some of those things, hopefully uh, we were hoping that the restoration of a number of those practices could then start to replace the spokes on that wheel as we move back towards uh, wellness, wholeness, you know, a sense of uh, restoration of that, that sense of integrity. And when you start putting one cog of the wheel or one spoke of the wheel back, it becomes really evident that it locks into another and slowly that wheel starts to, starts to operate again. Um, so I've been operating now as an artist for 28 years. The, the art of tamoko, uh, Māori tattoo, um, the revival of that art form is just roughly somewhere between 20 to 25 years old. It's a massive social and cultural phenomenon if we look back 25 years, no one more moko. Yet all of our carvings on all of our ancestral houses, all of the marae, all of the photographs of all of our ancestors in every, of those, every one of those houses, every one of them has moko. You know, there's been a latent, or 25 years ago, there's, a, there's no way in which you could deny the latent and, and existent memory of moko as a tool for... I suppose uh, it speaks about a whole number of things. Identity, connection to people, connection to land. It's, it's the very essence of your expression of your relationship to your environment and your world. Uh, it was outlawed by um, a Crown Act in 1908 called the Tohunga Suppression Act. And the Tohunga Suppression, a Tohunga is a person who's an expert at, at something. So our healers who were Tohunga, our carvers, our tattooists, our priests, all of those roles were effectively outlawed by this act and you were able to be imprisoned uh, uh, because of it if you were practicing any of those things. Uh, in reality, our community was suffering from uh, so much upheaval that we were struggling even just to keep ourselves together anyway as it was. So the nail in the coffin really was the Tohunga Suppression Act and Moko, um, there are a number of things that also contributed to, uh, I suppose, the, the, the dying out of this particular practice, but it happened really quick. And uh, after that, it, it was basically non-existent for 100 years. Um, it was quite a perilous journey, I suppose, uh, reviving moko. Uh, predominantly because Predominantly because a lot of our old people still had the the tapu, you know, the, the notion of the tapu nature of moko at the forefront of their minds. When we spoke to a lot of our old people, they didn't want us to revive it. They were quite emphatic that they didn't want anything to do with it, actually. Uh, and I think that's really got to do with with um, with the notions or the relationship around blood and, and infection and all that sort of thing. But the, the nature of tapu was is that it was still quite mysterious for a lot of our old people. Um, but there was a, 
There were three of us uh, predominantly that were involved uh, with reviving the art form. And I think we, was, we were quite politically driven. We, could, uh, we understood uh, all of the people that were the first generation Taumoko artists um, actually well educated. They're not only well, well educated in, in the English world, but they're also very well educated in the customary Māori world and in those customs and history and et cetera, et cetera. So it, it was really obvious to me that the people that were at the, there were three of us at the beginning and then they ended up becoming probably about a handful of probably eight to 10 people that really pushed really, really hard to, to kick off the revival of Tamoko. Excuse me, I'll just change the setting. Um, and uh, if you look at it, if you look at Tamoko now in, in New Zealand, from 20 to 25 years ago, absolutely no moko to now, probably probably half the Māori population is moko. Um, from facial moko for the male, which is the full facial moko, to the um, female moko, which is a part of the face, to the moko peha, uh, moko puhoro, this one here, um, right through to all sorts of different types of moko. And the revival of that has been closely linked with the restoration, I suppose, of and the resurgence of Māori identity as, as part of a, a, a tool to really combat the overarching, you know, New Zealand or Kiwi uh, notions of, of nationhood. This type of moko here takes six days to do, six days from dawn to late at night. So they're, they're not, you know, they're not insignificant uh, commitments. So the role of moko, uh, and most of you will, will have seen now the level of, uh, of tattooing, not only uh, in the Pacific, but also throughout the rest of the world. Māori and Polynesian tatau, or moko, uh, has become, I suppose, the, the most widely sought after moko um, throughout the rest of the world. There's large numbers of people in Europe uh, and other parts of the world that have, have moko on them. And it's an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting debate in New Zealand. We have, we've had a debate amongst our own community about what that's about. And um, I think that, that the explanation of that can happen on a number of different levels. Uh, I think one of them is a, is a search for a process or a way to mark which uh, I, I should um, just remind you that uh, that's exactly what it is within our community, to mark a significant time in, in their lives and a way in which they can find something meaningful to, to mark a particular point in their lives. Customarily, moko was the, the practice that you went through that demarcated the line between adolescence or, or you know, pre-pubescent, where you had no... Uh, roles and responsibilities to the to a time where you actually took on roles and responsibilities and you had particular um, functions within the community and it demarcated your your crossover between those two lines Kia ora. Well, it gaining, oh, oh, this is better. Gaining the healing from the colonization of, of the people, the colonial powers. Like, what role was that? And also, how is this different? I, does this take on different meaning than, I have a sister-in-law who is Samoan, mm. and they do similar. Do they mean similar things, or are they different in different cultures? I guess two questions, really. Yeah, um, can you ask me the first question again? I yeah, why were you so adamant oh, right, about... Okay. So, exactly. The, uh, the second question is really the answer to the first question. Uh, it's a normal part, of, and it's a normal part of the fabric that actually holds our communities together. You see the Samoan and other Pacific Island communities, you know, with the absence of a written language, well, in the absence of a written language, how the West writes it, this is our written language. 
So it's of no, you know, we don't see it as being anything different. And actually, uh, it's a significant part of, you know, from my observations of not only the Mormon faith, but many other faiths, every one of us has roles and, and uh, positions that we occupy, and the they're marked by titles and they're marked by uh, particular things that you fulfill within the community. The way in which in our society those um, roles and functions became obvious is by you wearing them. And in many ways they're no different than the, the way in which people in the West brand themselves with particular types of clothing. Uh, they have a dress code, like you, how you guys have a dress code. There are particular messages that roll with those things. and. Uh, and you know you might be, that might be your blind spot to see. You know, um, let's say it's it's quite interesting for me to come from New Zealand and see your dress code, because in New Zealand, if you're if you're hot, you just, like I just wear a singlet. I wear a singlet nearly. That's all I wear most of the time, unless I get cold. Uh, simply because it it's uncomfortable to wear anything more. You know, um, and we don't in New Zealand. You know, we don't have a strong kind of dress code uh, about wearing suits unless you're sort of uh, in the in, in business or something like that. Uh, otherwise, in our climate, it's, it's it's just not it's just not advisable because it just doesn't work. I mean, in, in my industry, you know. So, um, and and it's interesting too to also see your rituals. Uh, you know, as I travel, I spend a lot of time traveling just because of the nature of my um, my art and my business. Uh, I spend a lot of time, and because I'm trained as a social scientist, I spend a lot of time just sitting back and watching, observing, and it becomes, it's a funny kind of, you know, I, I sit there and I kind of, I mean, not with any audacity, but I sit there and laugh to myself because we fail a lot of the time to see our own level of ritual, our own level of um, the way in which we run our lives and how that communicates particular messages to the rest of our community. I remember one time when I was doing a, um, I was doing a public demonstration of moko, and uh, a Pākehā woman, you know, a European, a woman of European descent, an elderly lady, a couple of them were standing there, and they they uh, asked if they could ask a question. I said, you know, fire away, and she said, well, why do you people do that? And you know, I took a look at her, and she's wearing lipstick and all these other sorts of things, and I'm kind of going, well, you know, go figure. I mean, it's just how it is. The the those things that you have are no different in many ways than the things that we have, although a lot of the time we imply loaded messages to it without actually even getting on the inside and finding out what it means to that particular community. So we make assessments uh, uh, based upon our own epistemological worldview. Uh, sorry, at the back. Does the revival of Tamoko also include uh, the ancient practice of, of application, or do you just use... Uh, uh, that's a good question. Sure. Uh, we, have, we have used uhi. Uh, the Hawaiians call them... Uh, I'm not sure what, what some of the others call them, but our word for them is uhi. We've used them, uh, but for the most part, one of the things that we've been really, uh, really careful about is we were conscious that the revival of Moko depended upon the lack of opportunity for the media to demonize it by uh, you know, using Moko as, or talking about Moko. We've had a number of cases in, in New Zealand where people have got um, fasciitis, you know, flesh-eating diseases because they haven't cleaned their uhi, and, and they haven't been Maori, but they've been either Samoan or, or from other communities that live, in, live in, uh, in Auckland and other places like that. One of the things that we're really conscious about is to try and avoid, because otherwise we become a soft target for the media. So we've tried to avoid that. Most of us, and because a lot of our designs are curvilinear, it takes a lot longer to do than, than Samoan linear work and Hawaiian you know, um, geometric shapes. So uh, we've spent probably most of our time just using needles and guns. Um, it keeps the practice clean, it keeps the art form clean, and it keeps our people clean. Uh, we have a high percentage of our people that carry hepatitis, so we're just trying to make sure that we're not part of a problem, we're trying to be part of the solution to a number of issues rather than that. Sorry, there's another question here. 
I'm just uh, just before you ask your question. Now I'm I'm just moving through a succession of uh, art forms that we've been involved with, a number of shows that I've had where I've worked up a body of work. Now each one of these bodies of work have been uh, a response, a personal response of my own about some of the stuff that's going on politically or socially in New Zealand. Uh, that's the way I work. Uh, I, I usually choose, or when something hits me, gets me, you know, gets me between the, the ears, I, I start running with ideas and I produce a body of work of which, um, and I'm a bit, I'm a bit, I'm, I'm the odd one out in New Zealand. I was going to say I was a bit strange, but I shouldn't say it. I'm the odd one out in New Zealand because I've managed to cross over not only from customary arts to contemporary fine arts, but I also have managed to master a number of different art forms, whereas most people just kind of master one. So I'm a bit of an, an anomaly in New Zealand because uh, because of that ability to freely cross. I don't really know how it happened, but anyhow, it's happened. Um, question, please. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering real quick if there's spiritual is there, if there's spiritual significance to that to the tattoos and to your art, or is it strictly cultural? There really is no way to separate those two things. Uh, much in the same way as my observations of you know your community, uh, the organisation, social organisation of your community is arranged around your epistemological worldview. So everything has some sort of tangible connection back to your belief system and it drives the community and the way in which it operates. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So okay. on the basis of that, moko, moko, the moko designs are um, designs that have been developed either around um, environmental phenomenon, flora, fauna, and human experience. And so you can't really separate any of that away from the belief system. Other, well, other than the fact, of course, is that we don't, we don't live in a bubble anymore. Since the arrival of Europeans, we've gone through an, am an amalgam of you know, various influences, various churches that have come to New Zealand, Methodists, um, you know, Catholic, um, and, and as it goes through the ages, as new ones come along and have colonized as part of that colonial wave, our response to our customary belief systems have adapted to that. <laughs> um, and, and I'll give you an example. In the early 1820s when the level of conflict over Māori land became, you know, got to an incendiary point, a number of uh, what we have two prophets that, that we have in Taranaki, where I'm from, uh, we call them prophets because they they had visions and they were trained uh, from very young children. They were trained at missionary schools. They were taught to read and write through the Bible. So um, everything, all of their um, belief systems, uh, their leadership roles that they eventually took on in the land war process uh, was driven by their Christian belief system. Uh, their name was Tohu and Tefiti. There were two people, Tohu Kakai and Tefiti Orongomoi. And uh, when, in the 1820s, when it got to a, an incendiary sort of flashpoint, when the conflict between colonial settlers and Māori got to a point where people were starting to kill each other, they eventually moved back to Taranaki and started preaching the Rongopai, the good word, the, the Bible, um, Christianity. And they have become famous for creating a past site of which people from all over New Zealand came to uh, and resisted the crown in a, in a passive way. So their whole process of resisting the crown's attempts to get our lands, they send on, they would send on surveyors to survey our land. At night they would go and pull out the surveyor's pegs and then through the day they would plough the field. So all of these metaphors that they used as tools for passive resistance actually came out of the Bible to passively plough the fields, you know, all, all of that. All of those metaphors are, are rich in, in a biblical sense. Um, eventually, of course, the crown sacked that pa. They, they, um, they uh, imprisoned all of our men and sent them away down to the South Island uh, to do hard labor. So they suspended habeas corpus for two years, but in that time, most of them died because of the conditions down there. So um, an interesting, interesting note is, is that the books 
and the um, articles that were written about Te Whiti and Tohu's passive resistance against the crown were the same things that influenced Gandhi, of which, of course, went on to influence Martin Luther. So um, there's a tangible connection there uh, between our people and those other movements. Um, how am I doing for time? Got to rock on. So um, this is a, a body of work that I um, started. Uh, I started working out of this medium called Corian. It's a it's a composite media created by Dupont, or they make Dupont makes it. Actually, it was invented by a New Zealand guy, and he sold the rights to Dupont, and now Dupont make this material as a composite faux marble product for for bench tops for kitchens. So it comes in twelve mils, twelve mil thick. Anyhow, um, uh, I'd been working in in it to create small um, kind of taonga, what we call taonga wakakai, which are adornment objects. Uh, and I'd been looking for a new material to explore while I was doing my master's work. Eventually, I thought I'd have a go at um, trying to make larger three-dimensional works that exceed the, the boundaries of the material that, as you get it from the manufacturer. This body of work is, uh, uh, was in the Gough and Rosenthal um, dealer gallery in 2008. Uh, it's a paratha series. It's based around the idea of the canoe prow, and it's really actually a challenge not to anyone external from our community, but actually back into our, my, my own Māori community, challenging our people to uh, to actually leave behind some of our old stuff and have the courage to step off step off the shores the same way in which our ancestors did when they left Hawaii when they left Raiatea and all of the other islands in the eastern Polynesia um, belt. And, and move out into the Pacific looking for land. So that whole kind of navigator spirit, uh, you know, uh, it was really a challenge that I was putting out to our own people to develop that navigator spirit again and, uh, and plan for the future. Because for a, lot of our, for a lot of our communities, they still are retrospectively focused and anchor everything within a customary sense, even though the physical the social, political, and economic climate is radically different than what it was 600 years ago. And uh, this piece here is, a, is an installation that I did. It's an autobiographical whare, uh, an ancestral house. Normally an ancestral house was obviously an ancestor, and uh, it wasn't a normal common practice to, to uh, embody a living person within a house. So. An ancestral house uh, has a face at the front, the, the, the barge boards are the arms, and the, back, the backbone, of course, is the tahu that runs down the middle. So when you enter into an ancestral house, you're actually entering into the Ipanema's ancestor of those people that belong to that house. So in this, uh, in this installation, I was um, exploring, I suppose, my own idiosyncrasies, realising that when I had become a little bit more truthful about myself, I, I wasn't just locked within a customary paradigm uh, within my people, but I was always, you know, when I was a lot more truthful about who I was, I really straddled this strange divide between my customary role and my customary position and the role that I played within my community and then this other kind of role that I played when I existed within the Western paradigm. And, you know, I suppose throughout the process of this project, I'd come to terms with realizing that it didn't have to be one or the other and that the discomfort or the conflict that I felt between those two um, sometimes conflicting roles just was what it was. You know, I, I had become comfortable with the, the reality that I, I actually just straddled two worlds. And that's why this house actually doesn't have, a puku doesn't have a, uh, it actually has two porches. So you think you're actually going into a house and you go through the porch through to the other side and you get to, um, the other, obviously, a porch on the opposite side that has a different message. Any questions? Now, this was uh, in the this was in the new Denver Museum of Contemporary Art, which opened in two thousand and seven. So I've broken a whole lot of uh, customary paradigms here. You know, I, I use a lot of color in my work. Um, uh, for most people, you know. A lot of my stuff is really, really quite out there. Um, I, I try to challenge not only my own practice but also um, push the push the paradigm of our of our customary boundaries, so that um, I suppose one one of one of those 
attempts is really to to be a little bit more honest about myself, but also um, to challenge our own people and really our, our rangatahi or the children of the next generation to to inspire them to um, to break free of at least customary paradigms or at least reinvent new ones. We're in a pretty angry time in New Zealand at the moment. Um, for the first time, we've, uh, we have had a Māori party, a, Ma a party that has managed to get into government, which specifically chooses to represent and, uh, and, advocate, f and advocate for, uh, for, for Māori issues because for the most part, um, the, both the Labour government, which has been the, the left, and the national government, which is the right presiding, it's usually either one of those two that are in power. Uh, it was inconceivable five years ago to think that not only that a Māori party could get into parliament, but also that a Māori party would go and, uh, and, and have a coalition government with a national government. Uh, I, I would never have picked it, and I doubt that uh, hardly anyone else would have ever picked it either. So, in the process of that, though, there's been some allegations by sectors of our community that the Māori Party has actually sold out, that they haven't achieved all of the aims that they were after, and that they've compromised a number of times. And so now what we've got is a new party that set themselves up called the Mana Party, which is even more extreme, even more um, uh, aggressive in its, in its uh, advocacy for separate notions of Māori sovereignty. Uh, to tell you the truth, I struggle with it. Um, there's a lot of discussion going down on uh, various parts of Facebook. It's become uh, an important, um, it's become an important tool now for, for Māori to debate and argue uh, across, across the, you know, the realities of our geographic separation, uh, not only domestically, but also internationally. And, uh, We've got a sector of our community that are even more militant than probably what we were 25 years ago. Um, how that's going to pan out, we'll know in about a year's time. Um, but I suppose what I'm really trying to move towards is the end part of those propositions that I put up, which is the questions around, I, I think that the polarisation of our communities when I'm saying our communities, I'm talking about Māori versus Pākehā. Pākehā is our term for, you know, like Palangi or, or European. Um, has become more polarised because of our inability to, to clearly allocate what is actually really, really important, which is not the money, but it's actually human relations. And my proposition is, is actually the word love. Even though that's a, a hard, a hard, word to quantify, I mean, if we're being honest, it's actually really simple to resolve what that word means. Um, I, I suppose the hard part is actually where, where we, where you stand in relation to the question and how you resolve that at an individual level and then how you actually put that into action. Uh, um, the same question could be asked of you and your indigenous populations here, I imagine. And do you hear their cries? Uh, do you engage in the nature of what their debate is and what their questions are of you and your occupation of their lands? And what is the future for both your community and their community? Because uh, those are the questions that our community is asking of the dominant culture in Aotearoa. One of the strange, one of the strange and, and probably exciting uh, incidences that I've had over the last 10 years when we've had discussions about this, is that we occupy, uh, we occupy a country that we've been in for a thousand years and that the dominant, um, predominantly English uh, colonials have been in for a couple of hundred years. And one of the weird things is, is that when Joseph, we were running a, a decolonization, my wife and I were running a decolonization um, course for our students at one of the polytechnics back in, in Taranaki, where we come from, and we managed to, we, we received an email from Joseph and his crew, they were already in New Zealand, but he must have been on the web and had seen some of the stuff that we'd done and asked if they could possibly change the itinerary and come and visit us. 
one of the strange things that happened for me uh, when they arrived was is that when we invited them in and we went through the protocols and engagement, you know, their whole process of engagement, and, and they became part of, of, uh, of the process that we were running on, on the marae on those three days, one of the strange things that happened for us was, was that we were able to have a discussion with them about issues, about sovereignty, about all these sorts of things that I've been talking about that for some reason we couldn't engage with or that the community that's been living with us for two, three hundred years couldn't engage with us. I found that really strange that a community, a group of Pākehā people from another continent could come and engage around those debates and talk about those issues with us, yet the people that have been living with us for 300 years couldn't do that. That seemed to me to be very strange. I, we found that very very strange. And it's part of actually, and I suppose it's really the nature of the frankness and the honesty that Joseph and the other staff and students spoke with when they came with us. I, I suppose uh, one of the freedoms that they had was is that they weren't bound by all of their cultural baggage. They could actually discuss with us freely around around those uh, those issues because they didn't have they weren't implicated in the process. Uh, but it's been that's actually been part of the um, the basis for our ongoing relationship. Uh, I'm going to probably finish it there unless uh, and really just open it up. I know people are leaving. They've got other classes. If you've got any questions, um, feel free to ask. I've actually brought some pieces in here too. If you wanted to have a look at any of uh, any, I've brought a number of pieces that I've made while I've been here. A couple of uh, whale teeth. Chevron uh, works. I've got a couple other pieces here. So if you wanted to come up and have a look, they're here for you to have a look.